What a great pleasure it is to welcome to What's Next, Rian van Niekerk, who is the founder and chairman of Metacom. And for those of you who don't know Rian, he is uh, an accomplished thought leader, technology architect, he's an innovator, a serial entrepreneur who's uh, been in multiple companies and engineered multiple companies, and uh, he is known as a veteran in the industry. He's got more than... Uh, I don't know, Rian, 40 years of career experience in uh, technology, engineering and various projects. I mean, that's pretty impressive. And welcome to you. It's great to have you on, on, on the show. Thank you very much, Aki. Super to be here and really a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Now, listen, you, you clearly are very passionate about information and communication, technology, innovation, as well as in engineering. Tell me about your journey. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a 40-year-old journey. Where, where did it start and, and where are you today? Okay, thank you. Well, it actually started long before that. It probably started when I was about four or five years old. My parents bought me a Meccano set. You remember those Meccanos with metal plates? You could oh, build them. yes. But the important thing is part of that Meccano kit was also little light bulbs and electric motors and batteries and switches. And I think I played a lot more with the electrical side of the Meccano than with the actual metal bits itself. I was really intrigued at that very young age to connect the motors and the lights and the switches and see how things affected each other. I was really fascinated by that. But then fortunately, at the age of seven, a family friend bought me an electronics kit. And that just pulled me right in immediately. So throughout my childhood, electronics was my hobby. At that young age, I learned the basics about resistors and transistors and capacitors and electronic circuitry, made my own PC boards, and went on to build various electronic kits um, throughout my, my, my teenage years. Just before I turned 16, I probably built one of the first single board computers in South Africa. It was based on the old 8088 processor, if I remember correctly, and I had to solder all the bits onto this PC board, and the thing worked. This is going back to 1977. The thing worked, and I was able to program very simple programs, but still program the thing in hexadecimal code. Skip and jump forward, um, a Z80 computer, a Commodore 64, I think it was in about 1981, 82, and when pieces hit the market, I just immediately fell in love with programming and IT and everything related to ICT. Wow. Listen, uh, you're taking me back as well now because, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that Spectrum, the ZX80 and the Commodore 64. That's right. Um, and, and, and not forgetting the Atari before that. And um, I, was, I was completely fascinated growing up about how a television signal mm. came in via the air onto a television. And I remember the one day taking apart our television. In those days, televisions were very expensive and, uh, oh. and not putting it back together properly. Um, so oh. I remember that day because I, I really got a, 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 a quite a bit of, I heard quite a bit of noise coming my way. Um, oh. But oh. anyway, that's, that, that's how you learn, you know, and that's the, the yep. curiosity and, um, and you share that uh, incredible curiosity. So well done and what an incredible journey uh, that you've been on. But, you know, moving forward, it, it's incredible when you look back to the yep. 70s, as you described, and where we are today, the yep. breakneck speed that we're moving at and, you know, Moore's Law and the impact Moore's Laws had on computing. What have you found particularly challenging about building an ICT company? Built on, based on uh, you know, self-developed routers and systems in Africa. I imagine that must have brought its own challenges. It certainly was a massive challenge. I think I went into it because of my sheer drive and belief in, in, in the future of the country and technology, but it was a very, very difficult journey, certainly. The main challenges were probably that in this country there's a lack of investment. That's, that's, that's a, that is a big issue. There's a lack of investment. So everything I ever did, and this is my fifth company, which I started 22 years ago, has been a challenge. Uh, bootstrapping, trying to make it on our own, just making it work. So lack of investment has always been a real issue. The other problem that we had is a lack of expertise because so many of the top engineers immigrate. They leave the country because there isn't enough happening mm. here. And uh, we are very fortunate in that we employ engineers in all four areas that affect information communication technology, which is electronics engineers, 
firmware engineers, software engineers, and also network engineers. And to find these people is really very, very hard. But over time, we did mm -hmm. find a team of absolutely wonderful people. They are there. You just have to find them. So there's a challenge in investment. There's a challenge to get the right expertise. Then there's also a challenge that all our suppliers are so far away. They really, really, they're either 10 hours ahead of us or 10 hours behind us. That's also a challenge. And um, the other problem which I found, even as the company grew over time, is that our market just is very small. If we get a large order for a particular device, we're over the moon, 5,000 you know, devices, and then you place mm -hmm. all the components, and they tell you, oh, really, 5,000, that's like a sample drop. You know? <laughs> so, so that was certainly, certainly a um, challenge as well. And uh, maybe a combination of things historically, etc. The quality of South African products are deemed to be inferior very often. That's not such a problem anymore. But in, this, in the past, it certainly was. There was a perception that the quality was maybe not quite what it should be. And the other challenge that we had is that we generally found that IT departments are risk averse. You know, if they take an international brand and there's a problem, it's not their fault. You know, it's the the uh, brand's problem. With us, a, a relatively unknown business developing routers, communications equipment, we'll speak about that more later, I hope, um, uh, it's, it's they, they had to take a bit of a chance. But what we so often found was we would get the opportunity to sort out one or two of their most challenging remote locations. And because we were always mm. successful, we installed a few more, and then a few more, and then a few more, until today, we are very fortunate to have many tens of thousands of routers installed across Africa and the Middle East, working incredibly well and integrating all that communication services for our uh, corporate customers. Wow, that is such an interesting story, you know. And I, as you were talking there, I'm just thinking that you know we 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 we're so unique geographically where we are. Uh, that I guess that you are able to mold your organization based on your on the location and the the types of technologies that we have over here, for example, that would make them more robust, etc. Uh, going forward, but we'll unpack that a little bit later on. But why why would African companies choose products and services designed in South Africa, for example, and not from anywhere else around the world? I think the main reason is probably that we can sit and speak to our clients. We are here, we are local, we understand what they need. And remember the important thing in conjunction with all of this is that even though we develop and design and manufacture our own routers and associated equipment, we're not in the business of selling boxes. That isn't our business. Our business is actually high reliability point-to-point -point communication services. And for that, we, we originally felt, and still to this day, that we need routers with a particular kind of configuration that is not available on the open market. So we've customized routers to work in a special way with integrated services, which in certain respects we believe is unique in the world. And um, these devices are just endpoints for our customers' mm. equipment and computers and LANs and networks, etc., to connect to our infrastructure. So. We, we understand what they need. We understand the challenges in South Africa and certainly also into Africa. And we are right here to sit in meetings with them to take into account what they need. If they need changes to our, to our products, to the actual hardware, we can take that into account mm. in future versions. If they need changes to the actual code and the functionality on the core network infrastructure or the devices out in the field, we can do that for them and update or upgrade our devices anywhere in the world over the air. You can't do that with the big international suppliers. Yeah. We are here, we can hop on a plane, we are based in, in South Africa, in Cape Town, we can hop on a plane, jump into a car, be with our uh, customers within a matter of hours and talk about their problems with them and implement solutions. And that particular point has stood us in incredibly good stead over all the years, mm -hmm. that we can do what they need the way that they want it, they can check it, they can co-engineer it with us and then implement it. And man, we've had some wonderful successes in that arena, being able to work with our customers. Yeah, I mean, that, that personalization and customization that you talk about is really, and, and, and you know, today that you know, systems have become complex and very unique in what they deliver, and I guess that that, uh, that uh, personalization 
and the mm-hmm. ability to customize products for your clients has made you stand apart from the competition. When you look at engineering, and, and for me, engineering is absolutely fascinating, and, the, and you look at the core principles of your engineering and business model, what, yeah. what would you say those are, Rian? Well, like, it's interesting that you're asking both engineering and business in the same question, because even though the mm. two are unrelated, they're very related. So let me start with the products, the engineering. I've always asked my engineers to develop products to the highest possible quality within reason, irrespective of price. So for, for me, it's been very important that we, we develop uh, uh, products which are robust and reliable. You know, as I said earlier, with tens of thousands of routers installed across Africa, we cannot have unreliable products. These things must work. They must be robust. So many places, our installations are very often only a hundred kilometers from an airport, but to get there takes you hours and hours in a four by four. They are the most remote locations throughout Africa you can possibly imagine. So reliability and quality is absolutely fundamental. Then we take the business model. I said, we need to develop the highest quality products. And it is our responsibility as a business to, to create a business model around those products to make money. And in that regard, the one important thing which is not, which has never been negotiable in, in the history of Metacom is that the products that we sell come with a recurring fee in order to work. So we sell the routers, a bit like a cell phone. You, you buy a cell phone, but then you have to pay the network a monthly fee to connect to the communications infrastructure. We have the same model. And um, barring one or two little hiccups, for all practical purposes, our recurring income has increased every month for the past 20 years, which has been fantastic. So that has made the mm. business incredibly sustainable, and we have been able to, to continue investing millions of rands every year in engineering. The products that we develop, everything about them, the electronics, the, 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 the software functionality, the plastics, the metal, everything is developed by us or designed by us internally. So the IP of these products is entirely ours. And we believe that, that, um, that what, what has also helped this model is that not only do we provide high, high reliability point-to-point communication, but also value-added services. So we have developed quite a few products which requires a network to work on, for argument's sake, a multimedia system, and in-store radio, and voice over IP, and Wi-Fi services. Um, some of the biggest banks in South Africa uses our Wi-Fi and failover services on a national basis. Um, one of our largest corporate customers, PEP stores, they have many thousands of shops and stores in the entire PEP group, being Ackermans and Infinity, etc., across Africa. In every single shop across Africa, there is a Metcom device. But we provide the back-end communication services, the integration to head office, and all the connectivity that they require to about 40 or 50 partners. So we have the connectivity to the banks, third-party payment gateways, to um, third-party uh, transaction payment systems, etc. Mm. So if you walk into one of the PEP group branches anywhere in Africa, you are using our service and our system. Wow. That's, a, that's incredible, and it's great to hear that the, the systems are so robust. Um, and it says a lot that you've been in the business for a long time, that you've got these mm-hmm. customers uh, that they rely on you on this. It's a, it's a really it's a critical part of their business because if, if, if there's any kind of failure, they, they, they cannot operate. It's as simple as that. So the trust and reliability is certainly there. Thank you, thank you. That, that is a very interesting statement and I have been called into meetings more than once by directors of our largest corporate clients reminding me that we carry an incredible responsibility to their business sustainability. Yeah. And it is, it is absolutely a responsibility that we have always taken so seriously and I'm proud to say that we are mission critical to the success of, of actually all our customers. Mm. It is, it is an important point, and we work really hard. One of our driving forces is that we work really hard to make our customers radically successful. We do whatever we can to ensure uptime and reliable communication services because every transaction that fails is a loss of money. Yeah. 
Not only financial transactions, Absolutely. but all the, all the other systems. You know, financial transaction processing is only one part of our business. We carry all the communication services that our customers need in order to trade, in order to do business, in order to communicate with their head offices. That's a massive responsibility that we take very seriously. No, absolutely. And uh, well done. It's interesting. We, we talked about the innovation and engineering earlier mm. and you look at the continent and whenever you talk to people about the, the future of ICT and the future mm. of innovation and engineering on the continent in Africa, it's certainly very robust. And, and, and but there are challenges, of course, and it's not just in Africa, it's globally finding the right skills. And there's this mm. massive skills shortage uh, across the world and in Africa in particular, especially when you look at the growth and how fast we're growing, where do you see the future for ICT innovation and engineering on the continent? The short-term future, medium and long-term future, and one can only dream. But in terms of immediate thoughts, um, it is very heartening to see some of the biggest corporates in the world, Amazon, Microsoft, etc., investing so heavily in Africa and in South Africa in centers of excellence and innovation and building facilities here to upskill the locals, etc. So that's wonderful to start with. Secondly, um, I do believe that there are fantastic technological systems, hardware and software systems, etc., mm. being developed internationally, which are not always relevant to the Africa marketplace. And what we like to do is to see what's happening internationally but add the Africa flavor, the IP that we need in this country to develop brand new products, in certain cases unique, but certainly with a fantastic cost, value, functionality, uh, price point. Um, I believe that South Africa has tremendous potential for the future in ICT. Uh, some of the areas that we are working on, where I believe a lot more could be done by us and by others, is in the whole sense, uh, sensing and tracking capabilities uh, for personalization and integration of information for customized marketing and personalized campaigns, etc. So this whole thing about sensing, tracking, all the while taking into account copy and GDPR compliance, etc. Very important, but to understand who's doing what and when. And with the massive explosion in artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think this is only going to move further and further forward at a rapid pace. And certainly the rate of change is only going to increase and, and accelerate. Some other areas which I believe a lot of work will be done, is being done already, but certainly will be done even more, is robotics. Automation is a big issue. Mm. I think, I think Robotics and automation as a whole. Uh, automation can be hardware like robotics or software, automated computer systems, absolutely crucial. RFID, although it's an old technology, there's still a lot of opportunities for development in RFID. The one very exciting area which we are focusing on a lot right now is more and more communication, specifically taking into account low orbit satellite systems. We do believe that yes. that, that is going to be a a game changer in Africa because we have such vast areas, such vast uh, distances between stores or banks or ATMs or head offices. Low orbit satellites should give us the speed and the reach that we need across the entire continent and as we expand internationally. So those are some of the areas where I believe ICT will enhance or be developed in the future. Wow, it sounds very exciting, and I, I couldn't agree with you more on uh, what you said about robotics and and, and automation mm -hmm. and hyper automation and the, the the massive difference it's making into business processes, and it's just a a key in, in a value enabler in businesses mm -hmm. today. When you look at your strategy to assist the, the broader community and help build a sustainable and vibrant ICT community in Africa, where do you see it? We, we, what is your strategy in the, in, the, in the broader sense of a sustainable and vibrant ICT community across the continent? Okay, thank you for asking that question, because it isn't only about building a business that's sustainable and profitable for our own mm. people, but also for the broader community at large. So I'm very proud to say that we have just completed a creation of the Metcom Foundation, which I would like to speak to you about in the future. The Metcom Foundation has been established specifically to give back to the community by training people from previously disadvantaged groups in information, communication, technology and related fields. 
So we'll, we'll specifically look for people in networking, electronics, software, firmware, or a whole host of related fields in which we are experts, production, manufacturing, operations, etc. And then, over time, we have certainly acquired tremendous skills in all those areas and tremendous experts in all those areas. So the students that we are going to put through university in various degree courses, diploma courses, will also be mentored by seniors and highly experienced people in this field. So we believe that by, by putting people through university, and being able to mentor them, not only in their area of expertise, but also in life skills, in soft skills, and, and, and just growing them as people is something I'm passionate about. And we are investing a tremendous amount of time and money in that. And um, then, of course, what we would love to do is to, to also offer those people employment after they have qualified. Yes. So, so the two are unrelated yet related. We want to help people to study and go out into the community and also create for ourselves a pipeline for our future engineers as we expand the company. Wow, Rian, uh, I must tell you that your, your optimism and your outlook is, is, uh, is very encouraging. And uh, it's, it, you, you've got me excited about the future and uh, what you guys are doing. So uh, well done to, to all of you and uh, your company, Metacom. And thank you for joining us on this episode of What's Next to share the story with us. And uh, I look forward to watching the progress and uh, the next uh, 30, 40 years as you move into the continent and, uh, and build even more solutions around what we've been talking about. Because it certainly is the place where it's happening globally when you look at the amount of investment that's taking place in data centers. And, 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 and you know, uh, we, we take it for granted in South Africa that yeah. we live in a society where we've got this connectivity as we have right now talking to each other via this medium. But the reality yeah. is that most people on the continent still don't have access to Internet. And that is about to change and it's changing at such a rapid pace that it's going to change business dynamics across the continent. And that, for me, is incredibly exciting. So, Rian van Nieker, founder and chairman of Metacom, thank you very much for that inspirational story and joining us on What's Next. Okay, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure speaking to you. It is certainly very exciting. I'm passionate about what we do. I'm excited for the future. Africa is a, a fantastic place to be, a great place to be. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.